Our news is brought to you by Alive. Believe in best. Coming up tonight on Our News, what will happen once the state of emergency ends? The CDC to lower the Bahamas travel advisory to its less serious level three. The fate of furloughed workers still unknown. And a Bahamian student represents the country as a youth ambassador at COP26. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Christina Dragovich. Topping news tonight, in a matter of hours, the Bahamas will no longer be under a state of emergency. While many of the COVID-19 mitigation measures will remain in place in accordance with COVID health rules, Health and Wellness Minister Dr. Michael Darville insists a curfew is no longer needed. However, he admits there are concerns about ending it. Jasmine Brown reports. Now, the health minister says with more freedoms being restored to the Bahamian people, it's now up to the population to continue to follow those health and safety protocols in order to keep the COVID numbers low. 18 months was too long, and we need to control and manage this pandemic via a legislative route rather than forming an emergency state. 18 months. And you talk about increasing it. It's not acceptable and certainly not viable in order for us to be able to move our economy and begin to get our kids back to school, to be able to get our tourism sector up and going in a safe way, and the list goes on and on. The current state of emergency and accompanying emergency orders end on Saturday and will be immediately replaced by health rules that amended a section of the Health Services Act. The new rules will maintain the mandate to wear a mask in public, social distancing protocols, sanitizing requirements, entry requirements into the country, and other restrictive measures currently imposed by the emergency order. However, there will be no more nightly curfew or lockdowns. Some fear this could lead to social events not in line with the new rules. There's always concern. One of the greatest challenges anyone could face and any government could face is trying to regulate a pandemic. The health minister was also asked if the Davis administration would reconsider imposing a curfew if the Bahamas experiences a fourth wave. We understand the science and we understand what curfews mean. We're not convinced that curfews is a true reflection of the science and the reduction of community spread. It has a place because when you have a curfew, you actually can limit the movement of an individual at a particular time. What we're saying is that we're expecting Bahamians to be disciplined. We need to move forward. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Pearl McMillan announcing this afternoon that the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention will move the Bahamas from a level four health notice to a less serious level three. She says she was notified of this change by the Caribbean Public Health Agency. At the notification, actually, it was a congratulatory notification to say that we have been now DS downgraded to a three based on uh, the data recently submitted. So uh, I think the minister wanted me to say that. The Bahamas has been under a level four health notice since late August. Level four indicates a very high level of COVID-19 and travelers should avoid all travel to that destination. In recent weeks, new COVID cases and hospitalizations have decreased significantly. Six new cases were reported on Thursday. 47 cases are hospitalized. Dr. McMillian, encourage Bahamians to continue to follow COVID safety protocols. They have a combination of indicators that we monitor and we are, I would say, regularly uh, reporting on those indicators. And based on the last report that was submitted, we were able to actually move down. Up to this afternoon, the CDC's website still listed the Bahamas as a level four destination. The page was last reviewed on August 23rd. Well, as the state of emergency expires, the question remains, what will happen to furloughed employees? Bertheny McDermott sought answers from the Labor Minister. 
The fate of furloughed employees still undecided as officials have yet to determine what will happen once the emergency orders end on Saturday. There has been initial discussions. Um, I don't want to say anything which would uh, compromise uh, discussions. I'm going From here I'm going straight to me with the, the, the Director of Labor and from there we would be able to uh, say uh, what we, where we would stand. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. Some Atlantis employees have been furloughed since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in early 2020. The Employment Act 2017 mandates that once work have been sent home for a 13-week period, an employer has to either bring them back to work or terminate them with full compensation as required by law. However, under the emergency orders, redundancy provisions requiring local businesses to pay full severance to furloughed workers has been suspended. Labor Minister Keith Bell said he's hoping to resolve this issue next week. I don't want to preempt the discussions with, with the employer, so I'm, I'm optimistic. Labor Director Robert Farkasen said a noticeable number of employers have begun engaging furloughed employees. Press Secretary in the office of the Prime Minister Clint Watson said an employer has indicated the need to disengage workers, adding government is ensuring the law is followed. Not the emergency orders, the laws as far as payouts and as far as how it should be done um, and they've agreed to follow that and so that is our position with other companies. Um, it's one thing to say you have people on furlough but there ought to be at some point an ending point. You just can't have people just waiting and saying, we'll see what happens. Uh, there, there are a lot less people on furlough than there were uh, when we were in the height of this pandemic. Reporting for Our News, I'm Bertha McDermott. As the Ministry of Public Service continues to review promotions, officials are considering a number of changes, including a contributory pension plan. Minister of State for the Public Service Pia Glover Roll spoke with public servants on Grand Bahama today during a visit to the island. Jillian Gray has that. While touring the public service offices on Grand Bahama, Minister for the Public Service Pia Glover Roll assured public servants that every person will receive what is owed to them. There are persons waiting to be confirmed in the service who have been performing in roles for decades. There are persons waiting to be confirmed in the service who um, have passed on and retired, but still waiting to be confirmed. I'm sorry, but that is a disservice. Glover Roll says they've received thousands of calls since announcing that the new administration is reviewing promotions in the public service. She says it's time for social promotion to end. We're looking at confirming everybody that needs to be confirmed that do, and I'm going to, I'm going to stress this, that do not have adverse reports. Mm -hmm. You cannot work in the private sector and you're late, um, absent, mm -hmm. showing up and p performing at a low level and be engaged. This is not a dumping ground, okay? The public service is not a dumping ground. The public service is no longer gonna be the place where people say, well, I just need a job. We want to attract the best and the brightest. Another major change that's coming is the pension plan. Glover Roll says in order for that to survive, they'll have to switch to a contributory pension model. With the economy being that it is, um, we want to look at when we engage new persons into the service, that we're, we're exploring the option of a contributory pension, because no longer can we um, afford the, to take on the burden as a government. Um, so any new hires would now be invited to a contributory pension. And that is the way forward. It's, it's, it's the best way for us to do it. Um, that's just the only way we can our pension plan can survive. The public service state minister says she understands the deficiencies of the public service as she's been through it and wants to streamline the sector for the better. Reporting for our news, I'm Jillian Gray. Mostly cloudy conditions tonight. Greg Thompson is in the Weather Center with the latest. Thanks, Christina. Welcome, everybody, for your first look at weather on this cloudy Friday evening. Outside our studios, we have temperatures in the upper 70s. It's humid out there. Cloudy skies with just a few showers lurking in the neighborhood. Your winds are very light out of the southeast, four knots, and your feels like temperature in the upper 70s. Satellite view, a lot of moisture moving across us, keeping us unsettled across most of the Northwest Bahamas, some of that moving into the Central Bahamas, some showers and thunderstorms all ahead of a front, should push in here by tomorrow. We should see some more showers and thunderstorms tonight through tomorrow as well. That's your first look at weather. Stick with us, your extended forecast is still to come. Still to come on our news, Bahamar is in hiring mode. Why the government won't be publishing costs of specific trips and the government vows to build new homes on Grand Bahama. Find out more after this.
And the one thing we do know is that in every sport, one of the hardest places to get into is, of course, the place where only coaches and athletes are allowed. Today, that changes as we give you an all-access pass to the locker room. The football grew, as you have dubbed him. Uh, the, the LA Lakers are looking pretty good. The locker room. As the holiday season approaches, Bahamar is hiring again, according to resort president Graham Davis, who says they're doing their part to ensure associates are vaccinated. We're already in the hiring mode uh, for the festive season. Uh, we have jobs uh, available. Resorts across the country closed their doors last year when the COVID-19 pandemic brought the tourism industry to a halt. Meanwhile, unless there is some abnormality, the Davis administration will not disclose the cost of specific trips, according to Press Secretary Clint Watson. Since coming to office, several cabinet ministers have traveled internationally. Most recently, Prime Minister Philip Davis and a delegation traveled to Scotland for COP26, while Education Minister Glenis Hannah Martin visited Paris for UNESCO's 41st General Conference. I think maybe people want to know how much are we spending in total on travel rather than specific trips. Um, if, if, if it warrants that, I don't see why we have an issue not telling people. Um, I think it's important for people to know though that what we are do the bigger picture of the travel is what is your annual amount? What is, what is outrageous and what is a part of operating a government? Unless there's some abnormality and we have no problem addressing that if that ever arises. Watson says the annual budget shows the total allocation for travel. Both the Christie and Minnesota administrations came under fire for the frequency of government travel prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Watson says the government will remain consistent in publishing the allocations for its domestic and international travel in the yearly budget. And it's going to be identified as travel, so you'll be able to see the amount that's being published there. As far as what the previous administration would have done, this template would have been in place there. So just so all you have to do is go back to that report and there will be a line item for government travel and you'll be able to see the amount listed there. And we will continue that practice of making it public in our budget uh, uh, report. Minister of Housing Jo Beth Colby Davis surveying land on Grand Bahama as the government seeks to build new homes on the island, which was battered by Hurricane Dorian in 2019. She says her aim is to help more Grand Bahamians become homeowners. I also brought the new chairwoman of Bahamas Mortgage Corp, um, who will be assisting me with making those homeowners and my technical team, you don't see them here because they're already on the ground throughout Grand Bahama, looking and, and, and looking at the landmass and looking at some of the subdivisions that are already presently under Ministry of Housing. And so if there's a need for us to do any um, renovations to some of the properties or to get some houses built. Yes. That's what's priority for the technical team. Dorian caused an estimated $3.4 billion in damage and displaced thousands of families. Colby Davis stressed that rebuilding efforts on Grand Bahama and Abaco are a top priority for her ministry. It is important for the people of Grand Bahama to understand that this government is serious mm -hmm. about doing what it can to bring you back to a place that you know prior to Hurricane Dorian, and even better. Mm -hmm. And I know you have a good minister at the helm, and so we are here as a part of her support in our various ministries, and so that's why this trip was so important for us. And next up is Abaco, because if Abaco sees this, <laughs> I may get in trouble, so I have to say next up is Abaco. We're but definitely Grand Bahama and Abaco are my priorities yes, yes. to get them up and running. Well, business owners can take rapid antigen testing into their own hands, courtesy of Patch Employee, a new digital health solution created by Alive Creates. Alive Creates partnered with the Living with COVID Coalition to launch Patch Employee with internal rapid antigen testing as its premier to tool. 
Patch employee will allow businesses, churches and other organizations to provide COVID-19 testing on demand in several ways, including nurse testing at a private facility. The Patch employee subscription would offer access to the results portal and test kits. Additionally, a company staff members could undergo specialized training to learn how to accurately execute COVID-19 testing and perform tests on other staff members or customers. Thirdly, businesses can outsource testing to an external private lab, but make results available on demand via the Patch Employee app. When our news returns, what a return to classes could mean for kids this cold and flu season, and meet the Bahamian student bringing a youth perspective to COP26. Stay with us. And the one thing we do know is that in every sport, one of the hardest places to get into is, of course, the place where only coaches and athletes are allowed. Today, that changes as we give you an all-access pass to the locker room. The football grew, as you have dubbed him. Uh, the, the LA Lakers are looking pretty good. The locker room. This is our news. Welcome back. Mask wearing and other public health measures have kept levels of the flu and common cold relatively low compared to pre-pandemic seasons. However, with thousands of students set to return to school in a hybrid environment, this cold and flu season may be a little different. It will be very um, difficult as we go into the winter season, um, figuring out whether this is COVID, whether this is the flu. And so for any parent, if your child has symptoms, I'd suggest they reach out to their pediatrician, discuss what's happening with their child. So what should parents look out for? Pediatrician Dr. Jashan Saunders says there are some symptoms that overlap. It actually looks like the flu, and so it may be a hard differentiation in terms of whether this cold and fever is the flu or COVID. One of the things, though, with um, a common cold or the flu, if a child has been exposed to somebody with that um, flu-like symptom, they usually would become symptomatic one to four days. With COVID, the symptoms and duration of symptoms will be a little different. Their symptomatology would be longer. Then there's MISC, or multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which affects children after COVID exposure. These kids would have unrelenting fevers, they would have a rash, they would have red eyes, they may have abdominal pain. And the Bahamas technical team heading home from Glasgow as COP26 came to a close today. Among those representing the country at the UN Climate Change Summit is a Bahamian college student who hopes to see more young Bahamians get involved in climate action. Fonique Toot reports. Pretty much my life is surrounded by environmentalism and I know, I, and I know and understand how important the Bahamas' natural resources are, so I'm here to advocate for our country. I'm when the Bahamas government invited Cariel Stewart to attend COP26 in Glasgow as a youth ambassador, it was a no-brainer for the University of Florida student who has become a strong advocate for climate action. Stewart was just 18 when she volunteered during cleanup efforts in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian, which wreaked havoc on Grand Bahama and Abaco in 2019. To this day, we have no idea just how many lives Dorian claimed. Officials have warned the monster storm could be just the beginning if meaningful steps aren't taken to tackle climate change. Climate change is affecting us all, but it's really amazing to be able to see people from so many walks of life expressing how climate change is important to them and banding together to increase public engagement so that more of the world can understand really and truly what's going on. Stewart's passion goes beyond volunteer work. She is currently studying environmental management, agriculture and natural resources. We caught up with the 20-year-old between sessions at the UN Climate Change Conference. Um, a lot of our smaller nations don't have the funds to be able to refinance once the storms hit us. Um, we deserve compensation because we're not the reason that climate change is as impactful as it is right now. And when I say that, I mean larger nations are the ones that are emitting the most carbon into the atmosphere. And so as a result, we get the natural disasters and so do they, but we get more of them and we don't have the money to be able to re-implement things once they're damaged. Um, we don't have the money to implement industrialized structures to, main sh to make sure that people's homes are not damaged the way that they are as 
for example, Hurricane Dorian. Though young climate activists have long felt ignored by older generations of leaders, Stewart said it is time for her generation to claim its rightful seat at the table. There are a lot of discussions going on and youth, the youth don't have a proper seat at the table, so that's what we're pushing for. We're the ones that have the innovative ideas. We're the ones that have the power to initiate and incite change. So this is going to affect us. This is going to affect us, our children, and our children's children. I want my kids to be able to experience the world and the Bahamas that I know. COP26, which is the 26th Conference of Parties, came to a close today. The latest version of the COP26 draft agreement, which was released this morning, shows division among the parties on who should pay for the impacts of the climate crisis. Reporting for our news, I'm Vonny Tude. A wet start to the weekend and two young authors seek to inspire budding writers. Stay with us. And the one thing we do know is that in every sport, one of the hardest places to get into is, of course, the place where only coaches and athletes are allowed. Today, that changes as we give you an all-access pass to the locker room. The football grew, as you have dubbed him. Uh, the, the L.A. Lakers are looking pretty good. The locker room. Welcome back to our news. A few showers expected this weekend. Greg has the latest from the Weather Center. Thanks again, Christina. Welcome back, everybody, for your final look at weather on this Friday evening. Still some cloudy conditions outside our studios as a frontal boundary extending along the east coast of the United States and across Florida into the Gulf of Mexico. A lot of uh, moist and unstable air mass ahead of that, triggering some showers and thunderstorms across the Bahamas. We expect that frontal boundary to continue to push towards the southeast. Should clear out the first one, but we do have another front that's moving in behind or expected to move in behind that by Sunday. That one will usher in a nice cooler change in our temperatures and an air mass, so look for some cooler temperatures beginning next week. The remainder of the tropics, nothing happening out there and tropical cyclone formation is not expected for the next five days as we wind down the last couple of days in the Atlantic hurricane season. Beaching and boating forecast for the northwest and central Bahamas tonight through tomorrow. Southeast, the south winds 10 to 15 knots, it will fall light and rebel at times. While in the southeast, Bahamas caution flag out there for you guys for swells. East to southeast winds 10 to 15 knots, low tide will be at 8.54 tonight. Here's a look now at your national forecast. A look now at your extended forecast through Wednesday. Looking for some nice weather beginning Sunday and into the early part of next week as the second front pushes through. Back to you, Christina. Thanks, Greg. Well, a duo of young Bahamian authors is encouraging other budding writers to put pen to paper after getting their first books published. Author of Call It What You Want, Jaheem Wallace, says he began writing when he was just 14 years old. About a year later, he published his first book. I was encouraged by my friends to launch, to go forth and publish it. She thought that persons would want to know what I went through and they might be going through the same thing. At the ending of the book, there are some morals, you know, what persons can take from and learn into going into relationships. Later on, Wallace would meet up with Mariano Rigby Jr., who already had a talent for writing. I already wrote a compilation of poems, and he read one, and he was really interested, so we started our duo. But in terms of language, my love for language stemmed from my teacher, Miss um, Bailey. She was a huge inspiration for my language journey. Now the pair say the first step in getting published is to begin writing. Go for it and to get your art out there. Um, if you waste your time not trying to work, you will just die unhappy. So try to get your dream out there and do as best as you can. Thank you for joining us for our news tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Christina Dragovich. We'll see you right back here tomorrow night. Have a beautiful evening, Bahamas.